Hey there, it's Bitter Corella, and I'm once again in the unknown hellscape of the mind dream, and we're going to be talking about some dark tomes from some dark authors. So I'm going to ask the ironically bright orb of dark knowledge, which dark writer we are going to be discussing tonight? And of course, I don't actually have to ask it because I already know! We are going to be talking all about Dean Koontz. Dean Koontz, he's not Stephen King. He's the number two top horror writer, so that means, of course, he tries harder. And while Stephen King has been elevated to the status of real literature, Dean Koontz's very respectable number two spot makes him, well, pretty much king of the pot boilers. But that's still nothing to sneeze at. It is true that Dean Koontz lacks King's natural flow, and his prose is very often uh, forced and self-conscious, especially when he tries to be funny, because Dean Koontz, not really a funny guy. In fact, his idea of a good laugh is kind of a substandard Dave Barry type hyperbole. So though whenever he gets into um, making, the, making the funny, it's, it's actually a little bit painful. Nevertheless, Dean Koontz does have an impressive range. He's authored works that span from science fiction to medical thriller to techno fantasy. In fact, this kind of puts him uh, in, a, in a very different category than Stephen King, who is very hyper-focused on pretty much straight horror. Um, another thing that makes Steve, uh, another thing that makes Dean Koontz kind of interesting is that the supernatural actually plays a relatively small role in Dean Koontz's books. He's much more focused on man-made horrors, whether it's uh, scientific experiments gone awry, like that evil computer in Demon Seed, or just bad parenting creating psychopaths like Bruno Fry and Whispers. Now how do you know when you're in a Dean Koontz book? Let's count some of the common features of the Dean Koontz story. Number one, you're going to get a lot of idealistic normie dad heroes. Uh, generally, all of Dean Koontz's heroes exude a really strong dads against dating my teenage daughter energy. If, if, Dean, if a Dean Koontz hero has uh, a characteristic beyond being generally smart, brave, cool, awesome, tall, and strong, it's that they're usually filled with a deep sense of Weltschmerz about uh, this modern world. They just can't take this. They feel out of place in this world with all its promiscuous sex and wanton drug use. Generally, the Dean Koontz hero is a good man in a bad time. They're darkly brooding heroes who just need the love of a good woman to bring them back from the precipice and help them heal from that single, personality-defining childhood trauma that has caused them to grow up to be so handsomely and darkly brooding. Uh, Dean Koontz generally has a kind of quaint faith in authority, so you'll see a lot of his heroes tend to be uh, what we would call uh, authority figures, like cops, veterans, soldiers, a lot, of, uh, a lot of troops in Dean Koontz writing. Number two, I've already mentioned this, fewer supernatural entities, more man-made monsters. So you're going to get fewer things that come from beyond, and more things that, even though they're quite fantastic, generally have a plausible scientific explanation, at least in the world of the book. So you're going to get things like uh, machines that gain sentience, animals genetically engineered to be super smart, people who have psychic powers because, you know, they their moms took, I don't know, their moms, like, were exposed to microwaves or something. Number three, saintly women. Women in Dean Koontz's books tend to be kind, gentle, demure, quiet, unassuming. They tend to be beautiful in a very sisterly, non-sexual way. And they're just the right person to be there in a hero's time of need to help lead him back to the, to the, to the path of righteousness. Almost as if they were angels sent by the Lord God himself to help the hero in completing his quest. Number four, 
Well, if there are women in Dean Koontz's books who are sent by God to help the hero, of course you're going to get the literal hand of God itself appearing. So generally God does, God or the the power of God kind of permeates Dean Koontz's books. It's always there in the background. You always feel like God is a force in the Dean Koontz universe. And we'll be talking a little more about that in just a second. Yeah? What's up? Are you recording? Yeah. Is it okay if I ask you something? What? Um, if we ever actually get to go to another Star Trek con and, and I see LeVar Burton, remind me to tell him that I still listen to music from Reading Rainbow. Okay. Because I'm listening to teamwork right now. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. You should let me do the bottom of your lip because you got it all flat. That's the way my lips are shaped. I know. That's why you go over it. I do go over it. In the... In yeah. The, well, wait. You are, you saying, was it, are you saying that I, it's inadequate? That I didn't do a good job? I'm saying it would look better if you rounded out the bottom. It would make your lips look fuller. Oh. Because black lipstick's thinning because it's so dark. Alright. It makes your lips look thinner. <laughs> okay. Love you. I know what I'm talking about. I believe you. Five! Dogs, dogs, dogs! Dean Koontz loves dogs, and that makes him somewhat of an anomaly among horror writers, because most of them, from H.P. Lovecraft to Edgar Allan Poe to Frank Belknap Long, uh, they all like cats. They're all cat lovers. And Dean Koontz has specifically said that he doesn't dislike cats, he just has a terrible allergy, but he really, really loves dogs. And... So you'll find lots of dogs all through his novels, and, I mean, I mean, fair. I mean, if you like dogs, of course you're going to put them in. Why wouldn't, and, you know, why wouldn't you put your beloved pet into your art? You're not right, Kim. You're not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does give Dean Koontz's work quite a different vibe from more cat-heavy horror because, well, I mean, let's be honest, cats are aloof and mysterious, but it's a little bit harder to take horror seriously when there's a big goofy golden retriever in it. I mean, it's just a fact of the way horror is. Cats can die. Dogs can't. Nobody kills dogs. Now, if you watched my uh, Stephen King video, you already know that I attribute Stephen King's success to the fact that he's very mainstream and quite a bit less depressing than most horror writers. The fact that he sees the universe as a balance between good and evil, where it is possible for good to win. And Dean Koontz has a very similar vibe, which is why I think he's also very high on the list of horror writers. He, like Stephen King, is someone who can appeal to the normie, non-horror fan demographic. But there is one key difference. While Stephen King's Manetian worldview can best be described as spiritual but not religious, Dean Koontz has an overtly Christian vibe to his work. Yeah? You look annoyed. Oh, what, what is it? What instrument did your grandmother play? Violin and viola. Violin and viola? Yeah. Not cello. My mom plays cello. Oh, okay, because I told my mom it was violin and viola and she said she thought cello. So she's your mom. Your mom. My mom she, plays cello. Okay, I'll yeah. Evil in Dean Koontz's books is not an independent force. It's merely something that good allows to exist, either to punish the wicked or to test the righteous. And even in a lot of Dean Koontz's less overtly supernatural books, where the villain is, say, genetically engineered baboons or super intelligent rats, well. You can still feel the, the finger of God on the scales of justice in these books, kind of tilting it back towards good. That means that more so than most other horror writers, Dean Koontz tends to write, well, morality plays. And that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes he can use that to uh, quite chilling effect. Um, you know, when you take away the convenient excuse that evil is an innate force of the universe, 
and instead show that evil is all due to the choices of humans. For example, in Down in the Darkness, where a, a homeowner is tempted to use the mysterious House of Leaves-esque labyrinth that appears beneath their home to exact petty revenge on all their supposed enemies. Other times it doesn't work out so good, like in The Black Pumpkin, where uh, an evil jack-o'-lantern eats a kid's parents for being assholes. I mean, it just kind of comes off cross like an Are You Afraid of the Dark episode. Even more so than the King universe, the Koontz universe is a just one. It's one where things never get too horrific, and readers can always be assured that things will be set right by the final page. And that is why Dean Koontz is number two on the list of big-name horror writers. You'll always see him right below Stephen King. I'm sure he's going to be I'm sure he's going to love to be reminded of that. Anyway, thanks for listening to yet another rambling monologue about my favorite horror writers. If you enjoyed what you saw today, well, you can like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube, and if you're watching this on public access TV, you could do neither of those things. But you can go to our Twitter account at midnight underscore pals and learn more about our opinions on horror writers and in fact read some very amusing or so i'm told jokes all about my favorite and by extension your favorite horror creators in addition why not check out the we Ugh. in addition we do have our book currently available both in physical form and digital download so just be sure to check be sure to check out midnight underscore pals for more information on that until next time, uh, enjoy your mortal coils, and we'll see you more on Dark Tomes, a segment of Deep Cuts. Who's <laughs> 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 <laughs>